so back in college, I had this great professor, uh, Blanick. He's not my relative, but his last name is upset side of mine. Uh, doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, um, once he said this thing, and I said it a few times actually through the semester, two things happen to any code over time. It's either rewritten or thrown away. And I was like, whoa, that's awesome. That's what I'm going to do in my life, right? Huh. So anyway, that, then I go you know, enter industry and start looking at some actual code. And I have this mental model, you know, rewritten, discarded. That's what happens to code. You know, it's, it's great, you know, because it all makes sense. It's, it's great. But then I start thinking about this thing I will call generally code complexity. And it's complex. But anyway, I think it stems from two things. There is domain and there's the product itself. So it's in domain is the entities, relationships, the rules, nomenclature, you know, whatever it is we're dealing with in our domain. And then there is the product itself. And that's everything that, that we do as engineers. It's the code, it's quality, it's size, uh, how we build, how we review, how we commit, how we package, distribute, task plan, everything. And you put it all together and you get a project complexity. And I like to draw it like this. It doesn't imply that they're equal, but that they are normalized. So the complexity of the product uh, proportionally reflects complexity of the domain. And I think it's healthy and normal. That's how we imagine it, right? Whatever we're solving has entropy, and we produce another entropy on the other end, and we simplify it and output, something like that. I don't know. So how does it grow? And I think it's something like pancake model. You know, you pour it in a stove and it like goes in circles. Yeah. So you tap into the domain and you build bigger interface with it and your product complexity grows proportionally to the domain. And I think it's healthy and that's how we always thought it should be. But you know, then I started writing code for money. And I thought, <laughs> that's actually how it is now for the most projects I've been on. Not all of them, but some, the most. I call it shuttlecock model. Um, it's a thing, look it up. Um, <laughs> And it's not what you think. It's OK. Uh, <laughs> so what, what this implies is that the complexity of the product grows disproportionately faster than complexity of domain. So for every little thing I get to offer the customer, I get, I get tons of crud in my product instead. And that's just not healthy, right? But it, that's what I'm facing. And uh, I don't know why. But you know this great authority on software, it, I'm not sure exactly, but I think that's how the quote went, that all successful software projects are alike. You know, we all know how to do the right thing. But but they all fail for their own reasons. Like there's no one reason why they all fail. Like every failure is its own failure, but all successes, they look alike. And I'm back to this model, like <laughs> where is this, where's the wrong part? Why, why do I see it so different from what Professor Blanding postulated in his conjecture? He didn't call it that, but you know. And then, then, then I realized there is this, and I found it in Wikipedia once like, wait, that's like just the thing I'm, <sighs> wow, okay. Big ball of mud and you know, um, it was mentioned today in a talk uh, by uh, John Lakers, so I'm sure, I'm sure we all know what it is. So why does it happen? You know, it, it's, it's not just like a failure. It's something else. I think there's an equilibrium in the middle. It actually, the thing is maybe ephemerally, but stable. It's like abusive relationship, like everybody suffers, nobody can quit. Customers are stuck, management in denial, and engineers just can't do anything about it. They're overworked, they don't know what they're doing, they're underpaid, whatever. But thing is stable. You know, people churn out the code and it happens every day, but project already failed years ago. <laughs> But it's stably failed. Like, you know, the train just falling off the track, but it's not hitting the ground yet. And it takes a few years. Or you scoop the water as fast as the boat sinks and you still deliver cargo. I don't know, something like that. So what is missing? I'm thinking, you know, if I don't know how things are happening in this world, it's probably Pareto principle. Because, you know, 80-20, it makes sense. And everything all the time works. But I don't like it. It's too weak. It's too weak. I want this. <laughs> so I go back to my blinded conjecture. I'm thinking, OK. Professor Blanick, you worked in this for only a few years. You started teaching in 83. You didn't see a lot of code since then. I did. Um, how do I take your beautiful truth and combine it with reality? And I come up with something, with something like this when I take his beautiful idea and I, and I get this. That's what I think is happening. <laughs> you know you know what's in the middle, big ball of mud, I'll call it just ba -bum. So that's corrected Blanick's conjecture. And uh, here's the corollary. I call it corollary A. Think about it. Random sample of engineers, any one of arbitrarily taken, has 90% chance of writing his code for bomb. Like, you know, what, what do you think about it? I mean, you know. So, uh, what, what can we do? I mean, what can we do? I mean, seriously, it's like Tsutsuang, you know, it's like chess. Anything you do, you, you make it worse. What, what can you do? Nothing? Yeah. <laughs> But OK, OK, like seriously, this is a little radical. Like I can do it, you know. But here's more secular version. And I thank David Gofrido for this. It's like, you know, it's nothing and a half. Um, as engineers, you know, we, we, we were sort of conditioned in this thing. You see a problem, you jump at it. Can I do it in linear time? Ah, damn, it's a little complicated. Ah, but you know what? In half a day, I'm going to churn it out in logarithmic time. Just, just, just give, give, me, give me some time. 
Uh, but it, the time, I think, can detract us from something much more important and obvious, that this notion of writing code as first approach to a problem solution is just maybe in, in, in informed. You know, Maybe we should take a step back and examine that notion. And maybe we shouldn't write code first. Maybe we should see, maybe we can, could do something else, reuse, or uh, you know, delete code, or at least come net negative, or maybe ask somebody else to do it, or just you know, say, that's stupid, and not do it at all. So anyway, friends, um, be strong and do nothing. Thank you.